I'm going to start off by letting the panel introduce themselves because we've got a, our panel comes from varying backgrounds. So, Pierre, why don't you get us started with an in introduction? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Pierre. I'm the founder and CEO of Go Green Agriculture. We're a hydroponic certified organic farm in San Diego, California. Um, we come from humble beginnings. The, the company started off as a dorm room style project, as you hear certain companies start. Uh, today, we're a relatively sizable operation for the industry. Um, we have about two and a half acres in production right now under greenhouse. Uh, we're doubling uh, as we speak. In about 60 days, we'll have another two acres uh, added on to our facility. Um, we'll be producing about half a million plants per month, um, spinach, kale, lettuce, and uh, a few different leafy green varieties. Um, and uh, so my background, uh, my undergrad is in computer science. I have no uh, ag history. Uh, my master's is in business from UC San Diego. And uh, my family has joined me in this project now, and I enjoy working with them. So my experiences kind of go from raising just friends and family capital to more sophisticated um, industry capital. Um, and uh, that's it. We'll continue on. How many years have you guys been in business? Started in 2009. Okay. Kevin? All right. I, uh, I'm working with Premier Mushrooms. We're located out in Calusa, California. It's a small rural town about an hour north of Sacramento, for those of you that know where that is. Um, we have been around since 2007. We produce about 300,000 pounds of mushrooms per week. And we actually just expanded at the end of 2013 and brought on an additional 16 growing rooms, which took our volume from 200,000 to 300,000 pounds. Uh, we have plans in the next couple of years to create a phase three uh, composting facility, which will ultimately take our volume from 300,000 to 400,000 pounds a week without adding a single growing room. And the way we're gonna do that is by taking our growing cycle from eight weeks down to six weeks while keeping the yields the same. Um, we've uh, just a little, little marketing for us. We've been on Inc. 5000's list the last three years in a row. So we're, we're growing pretty quick and uh, it's uh, a very fast-paced uh, industry, and we're excited to, excited to be at the conference here. So thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about your growing rooms and how a mushroom grower ends up at an indoor ag conference? Yeah, so our growing rooms are completely indoors, obviously. Um, it's an R30 insulation, so it's a skeleton and then insulation around it. We have uh, 32 of our 64 growing rooms are hoop Quanta huts. And then 32 are actually uh, building structures, but the individual rooms are still separated, again, by R32 insulated panels. Um, and the reason for that is that the rooms have to stay at a constant of 65 to 68 degrees year-round. And in the summer, the weather gets extremely hot. It's probably on par with uh, weather out here in Las Vegas. We get summers up to 105 degrees. So our cooling bill is uh, tremendous. And... Um, ultimately, the, the rooms are about 120 feet long by 20 feet wide, and we have two sets of shelves per room, and the shelves are 100, about 100 feet long, 5 feet wide, and we have seven shelves per, per row, times 64. Um, to put it into square footage of growing surface, there's about 6,000 square feet of actual growing surface in, in every one of our growing rooms. Mark? Hello, everyone. I uh, had a chance to introduce myself just a little while ago. I uh, lead the marketing and business development for Aero Farms. We're a vertical farming company. Uh, we grow exclusively indoors without sun or soil. Uh, we're using LED lights and have been doing so for over five years, and I made that uh, commitment a while ago now. Uh, what's unique about our growing approach, we use aeroponics, uh, but our growing medium is cloth, and that's a reusable medium, so it's a great story from a sustainability standpoint, but it's really a great story from an efficiency standpoint. We actually are seeding, germinating, and then harvesting all in the same medium, so uh, very efficient from a labor, no transplanting necessary, less opportunity for the product to be damaged, and so it's a unique way of growing, and it's a holistic approach. So when we think about our growing systems in a similar way that Kevin just painted it, uh, a typical system would be 80 feet long, 20 feet high, seven levels of growing. Uh, it's very modular, though, and can be adapted to different warehouse spaces, and so this can go up to 36 you know, uh, feet. 
Uh, and again, that modularity can be adjusted in terms of you know, how much you want to put into it. Uh, we're in the process right now of working on our eighth installation and project. And so again, we talk about scaling, and this is a facility that will be over 70,000 square feet and be able to produce close to just under 2 million pounds of baby leafy greens on an annual basis. And so this is something that has uh, been proven out from a commercial standpoint and scalability standpoint. Nice. And I think since we're talking about scale, one of the important things to think about is our customer base. So um, would each of you just take a couple of seconds to kind of identify what your customer looks like? Pierre, why don't you start? Yeah, I'll start off. Um, well, when we started off, obviously you start with kind of the mom and pop uh, establishments. That's what you have easiest access to. As we built up, we now work with companies such as Cisco, Whole Foods, Kroger, Safeway, um, kind of the, the larger establishments. Our uh, customers are primarily retail food service, so we're about 60% in the retail space and 40% food service. So large food service distribution companies like Produce Express and uh, General's Produce in California, and then some of the bigger supermarkets uh, like Raley's and Albertsons, and then we also end up in Trader Joe's through uh, distributors, and as we expand, we'll, we'll keep that going. We actually... Uh, are working on getting into Target and then some of the smaller, uh, like Save More, Save Mart, uh, smaller grocery chains as well. Yeah, we have a wide range of, of different um, audiences. If we talk a little bit about the, the business plan and our model, uh, just a little background. We've been growing since 2004. We started out as a grower. Uh, our technology was developed uh, out of the Cornell Ag Program. Our head of technology was one of the professors there. His whole job was to take the technology and deploy it and use it in working with farmers. And we were initially selling into uh, local retailers and, and different uh, restaurants as well. In 2009, we received clean tech investment and we changed our business model in terms of that technology and then started operating as an OEM. And so we have a number of different partners who have been using our technology. And moving forward, we're looking at that as well, but we're also looking at owning and operating. And there, the focus is really going to be on retail. And it's about volume, it's about scale, it's about the margins and how we manage that. And so uh, key, you know, people have highlighted a couple of the different retailers, but it'll be about 70% retail, 30% food service. All right. Um, I'm going to do it a little different. Is there anybody have any questions about their businesses before we get into scaling up? All right. So we're all on the same page now. We're talking about what, this, what the businesses look like and now where we would go from there. So everybody kind of starts with a business plan, and this is where, we, as a group, we talked about before, is what are some of the trigger points that you look for when expanding or scaling your business? Mark, why don't you start this one? Sure. Well, uh, really, at the end of the day, it begins with your unit economics and understanding your operations. There's been a lot of discussion around, do you know your cost, do you know your business, and then thinking about what's the market then in terms of selecting the crop and what are the margins that you can achieve. And so you really need to understand those unit economics. And that's going to be critical in terms of, you know, again, how you scale and how you manage your operation. So that's going to be first and foremost in terms of how we look at uh, opportunities and we look at different market expansions. And that's really in terms of, again, how we manage our business. Um, Pierre, when, when uh, you guys have had pretty rapid growth in a fairly short period of time, was that part of your business plan or was that something that you uh, responded to market demand on? Uh, the fast growth is typically usually intentional and doesn't come easy. It doesn't just happen because things align themselves. Um, these are things that we put a lot of energy and planning into. So we started off with, with a business plan that outlines a, an aggressive plan on how to grow, setting benchmarks that are realistic um, but very, uh, you know, you want to set the bar high. Um, and as far as setting goals and kind of when the trigger points would be, for us, we didn't really set time time frames um, or, or benchmarks, what we set were kind of um, infrastructure bench points or, or volume bench points or when we need to, to get to the next level as far as saturating certain sizes of markets as, as we go. So basically we said, okay, let's start with certain products that we want to identify and let's sell out that production and then we get to the next step. Um, and we, we have that in a consecutive series of, of ways to kind of get from point A to point B. Um, and in getting from that trigger point from one to the next, you start to get into more challenging situations. For example, um, the, the food safety standards and, and just getting more um, as far as certifications and regulatory compliance, things that you have to deal with, it, get, it gets to be more sophisticated as you want to work with larger size companies and kind of do things on, on a larger scale. 
So these are things that we didn't anticipate or really plan for until you get there and then all of a sudden you start learning what is involved with working with some of these larger companies. So that's actually something that I'd recommend that people try to look forward or, or try to anticipate um, what would be involved in the benchmarks that you want to set understand what would be involved, not just in growing to satisfy a certain demand, but also understand how distribution, how um, compliance, how regulatory, all those things will affect you, and maybe we'll delve a little more into that um, and, and as you go. Kevin, you have anything to add? No, I think they, they hit the nail on the head with that. Okay, cool. Um, so, once, so we've gotten to the point where we made a decision to grow, whether it's part of a market plan or, uh, I'm sorry, a business plan or a market demand. Um, one of the things I'd like to jump into now is w how you manage the necessary resources to make that growth. And through the, through the course of the last couple of days, we've talked a lot about the human capital and where do we find, where do we find labor, where do we find qualified growers. But I, I think, Kevin, I'd like you to start on this because you, you and I talked about some things that were a little less obvious in terms of natural resources and, and how you manage that growth. Would you start talking about that as you guys look to expand and energies play and natural resources of water and things like that yeah absolutely so we're a we're a pretty big farm and it sounds like uh, as with most indoor farming operations we're very uh, energy and resource intensive and as a result of that there's a lot of uh, opportunity but also a lot of costs uh, associated with that so one of the key areas that we've really been driving down on is our energy usage so we have a, a huge chiller. Our cooling load is uh, upwards of 1,000 tons during the summer, and also a big natural gas uh, demand for boilers and hot water heaters. So what we've done is uh, last year we actually um, worked with the, the local utility, PG&E, to identify a new uh, chiller. Ultimately, it was um, something that we needed operationally but it was also an energy efficiency project. So we've looked into renewable energy projects and we actually just signed a contract on one, which I can go into a little further later. But the, renew the uh, energy efficiency was key. So we identified a chiller that was gonna save us 1.7 million kilowatt hours a year, which is the equivalent of $200,000 a year, just right off the top of our energy bill. We commissioned it last August and so far, we're, we're on track to meet that savings number. And um, kind of along the lines of that, we're actually involved in a 16-month continuous energy improvement program, which is also funded by the utility. We're one of five companies in a cohort, along with uh, Campbell's, Lundberg, Fam Lundberg Family Farms, Amy's Kitchen, and Land of Lakes. And the objective of this is to establish an energy reduction goal over that period. And then you have routine meetings, you form an energy team on site and actually prioritize initiatives around energy efficiency. So we recently made a few changes to, uh, you know, we have an, a louvered mezzanine upstairs, opening and adjusting those. We've gone from steaming twice to steaming once. You know, a minor set point change, changing our uh, chiller from 40 degree cooled water up to 43 when it's cooler outside and tracking that and actually being able to look on a graph and identify these savings numbers and trace it back to our utility bill. So I think this is something that not just for the, the ag sector, but every industry, there's a lot of opportunity there. And, um, you know, energy prices are rising. It's, it's scary. You hear about it all the time, but there's a lot of, uh, rebates and partners out there that are willing to help uh, help work with you on, on making those improvements. And then you're basically dialing in your costs, and that's when we would like to look at renewable energy. So it's energy efficiency before renewable energy. It's something that I think a lot of people overlook. So, And Mark, you know, vertical farming seems to be a great opportunity for automation. And uh, would you like to comment on how we may find some answers to where we find those growers by increasing our automation or making our, our, our systems more efficient? Yeah, in general, I mean, how we've approached design and thinking about our systems has been exactly in terms of making it really turnkey. And that's obviously from the perspective of having been an OEM and how to get different farmers up and running. And, you know, we've had success where 
people from an architect to a real estate developer all of a sudden becoming and growing high quality products. So that's really been a key focus from what we've had from a, a company. And it's also about how you maintain it and the simplicity there. So there's a balance in terms of when you want to go to automation and make it more complicated, and then when you want to think about the balance between maintenance and ongoing. I, I just wanted to build on some of the things that Kevin was talking, though, about resource management. And this is something that Aero Farms is extremely committed to. We're part of the Ellen MacArthur Circular Economy Top 100 companies. It's a select group of people for the three years thinking about thought leadership, thinking about the circular economy and agriculture, helping set that agenda. Um, our CEO is on the, uh, for the World Economic Forum on the Global Water Test uh, uh, council. So these are issues that are really near and dear to us and how we manage uh, our way of growing. We use over 95% less water. We use over 80% less nutrients. Uh, it's a closed loop system, so it's a lot more efficient. I talked a little bit about our growing medium. It's a reusable medium as well, so it's not energy intensive in terms of how you create it. So we're very much focused on that from a resource management standpoint as well. And Pierre, you guys have, you know, you've got, you've grown, you've got natural resource water issues uh, in Southern California. Can you tell us a little bit how you've grown, maybe how you've worked with the city and how you look at those those different resources in your area, which may be a little bit more of a traditional hydroponic farm than than what these guys are dealing with? Yeah, so so resources obviously is something, well, in, in California we're having a major drought. And actually I was just seeing in Time Magazine that um, scientists have predicted that we're going to be in drought for the next 200 years based on, uh, you know, l looking at trees and, and the way things are, are like that. Um, you know, this is something that things are always shifting as far as resources that are available, whether it be human capital or actual uh, natural resources. And these are things that are just inevitable and any business needs to be able to adapt to, to their changing environment. Um, so I don't want to make it necessarily specific to what I'm going through, but kind of apply it to what everyone else may, may, may kind of go through. It's to me, the, the most valuable resource, and especially when we're talking about replicating a farm and growing it, is the human capital aspect. If you want to maintain consistency, uh, food safety standards, and just the standard quality that your customers expect from you from one location, now at 50 different locations, human capital, basically your employees that you're going to bring on board, are going to be, in my opinion, the most important part of scaling the operation and your most valuable resource. Um, one from the grower that you're going to have, who's going to maintain the, the food safety, safety standards, the actual growing technical aspect, and maintaining the same standards. Of course, the, the labor that's involved um, on the day-to-day -day operations, that's also a scarce resource. Um, I'm actually going to be in, in, in D.C. in two days uh, lobbying for some of the immigration reform that we need for our industry um, because these are really challenging uh, things that we face. So this is where automation kind of comes into play and we look at at what point does it make sense. Um, now I'm a fan absolutely as, as I think everyone here is for simple automation. Um, we don't want to get into very complex type of machinery. You end up with, with people who, you know, you need to have a, a high tech person on site and that's not necessarily scalable if you want to have, again, we're talking about 50 farms um, to have a person on each one. So keeping simplicity um, and, and the, your human capital as in my opinion, being your most valuable resource. That's a key point where in your business plan you have to address how you intend to source your, your human capital um, and retain it and scale it. So the, the next question is, is really something I think we've heard a lot about over the last couple of days, and that's financing this expansion. Uh, would either of you like to talk about ideas or ways that you've successfully found capital uh, to expand? Yeah, so our most recent expansion, the uh, 16, final 16 rooms out of 64, we uh, were able to partner with the County of Calusa, and we worked with them. They uh, received the Community Development Block Grant from the federal government, who loaned it to the county, who then loaned it to us. And in return, obviously, when we grow, uh, we bring more business to the local community, stimulate the local economy, and we are also very active in the community, which they know. So it was sort of a partnership and a relationship that we've been building with, with Calusa County that's actually uh, turned into a, a very successful uh, relationship that enabled us to build out another 16 rooms. Um, without them, I, would have, I couldn't say if we would have done it yet. So that was at least this most recent expansion um, that was one of the ways that we went about finding financing. Mark, you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, I mean, economic incentives and programs and initiatives like that are absolutely critical. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to have a core business that can stand alone as well. And so uh, it's helpful from a CapEx and capital improvement, but the operating, you know, you make, you make sure that, again, you have strong understanding of those unit economics. Uh, and we've heard a lot about the different financing opportunities in terms of whether it's VC, in terms of truly scaling, getting to the private equity standpoint, and being able to demonstrate. I mean, obviously, you know, we heard a threshold yesterday of 10 million revenue, 10 million EBITDA. You know, you hear something like when Kevin shares his numbers, they're getting close to that. And so in terms of being able to uh, think about different levels of investment, those are definitely opportunities from a scaling standpoint. Uh, a big part of this is making sure that, and again, there's been a lot of interest. We heard about it yesterday as well in the panel on the financing. A lot of people looking at the space, a lot of people understanding, you know, what's happening and what's differentiated. And again, there, we heard a couple of key things. It's the team, it's, the, it's that human capital standpoint. It's, uh, again, the technology and the IP. Uh, and so I think, again, we have a patented approach in terms of our growing uh, approach. And it's a holistic one where, again, we have a lot of efficiencies from a labor standpoint as well as a workflow standpoint that, again, when people look at our unit economics, uh, that's been attractive to be able to garner uh, investment. So we've had investment at the corporate level. We've also been able to secure project financing as well. Pierre, you want to add? Yeah, I just want to say I think I have somewhat of a, a relatable uh, story as to financing. So when I was an undergrad, I said, you know what, I have this great, fantastic idea, and uh, but I have no money to do it. So where do I start? And here I am. I'm a person with no prior work experience. I don't have a sophisticated, uh, you know, capital raising background behind me. Um, so I, I think a lot of people can relate to being in that type of uh, scenario. Um, for me, what I first did was I went out and, and raised what you would call a, a friends and family round of Hey, friends and family, do you believe in me? Um, you know, would you contribute $2,000, $2,500, put together a small pool of money that gets you to be able to kind of put up a little pilot plant, show what you, what, what you intend to do, show that it's possible to do it. That's what I did for the first year that we started off. I put together about, um, over time in that year, maybe about a quarter million dollars of just small little, you know, family coming together to, to do that. And, it, and that's where I started. From that point forward, I wanted to put down a world-class style mini operation that I could now demonstrate um, is viable, is scalable, and is something that we can now take to another level. At that point, I went out and started now looking for a more sophisticated type of capital. And this is where um, uh, I was actually fortunate in that a lot of VC money kind of flocked to us and was thought it was a good opportunity. But to me, the, the financing mechanism that you choose is not just about the money, it's about the, the additional benefits that come with the money as far as having a strategic partner to work with. Um, so the, the partner that we chose was, was based on somebody who could add value in addition to just the capital that they were looking to put in. And actually, the person who, who we chose was actually someone who gave us less money than, we, than others had been offering us because we saw more value in them as a partner. Um, and the, also, timing is very important as to when you do that. If you do that very early on in the business, you're going to be sacrificing a larger percentage because you haven't proven your business yet, and they're going to be looking at, as, as they're mentioning, EBITDA, earnings before taxes, and, and all that type of stuff. Um, so if you don't really have something that kind of pencils out, everyone will say, sure, you're, you're giving me this projection of, of making a lot of money, and that, that'll go against you. So the longer you can go before you can actually demonstrate profitability, viability, you, you, you get more on that end. But then again, timing, do you want to grow fast, or do you want to hold it as your own and kind of grow more organically. These are all choices that are, are up to you to make as, as to when the timing really makes the most sense. Um, it's kind of our capital story. Yeah, I would just build on that it's important that as you go through it, you maintain control. Obviously, you want to bring your vision to life. And it's also with those investors, just to kind of build on this again further, is just, there has to be a shared vision, an alignment of values. And there has to be an understanding in terms of that time continuum. So you, you do have a business plan, you do have milestones, and you do have you know, significant um, reporting that you need to do in terms of hitting them, but it's a collaboration, it's a partnership, and it's about bringing in the right people. You know, again, one of the things we heard yesterday is about, you know, how do you have the right advisory board and so forth. And so we've taken a really rigorous approach to that. Um, our, one of our independent board members, Ron Hart, Dr. Ron Hart, he's the former chief scientist for the FDA. And we take science very, very seriously, food safety very, very seriously in terms of, again, making sure we have the highest level there. Uh, another independent board member is uh, one of the founders from Method Cleaning Products. So again, thinking about how do you be an environmental champion and, and do it in a way that 
breaks the paradigm and be able to compete, you know, again at retail. And so those advisors are a really critical part of this and as much as uh, making sure you have good, good alignment around the values. One of the things that, you know, uh, Horde Americas we've struggled with is our business model kind of changing as we grow. Um, one of the things I'd like to hear from you guys is how do you feel your business model or uh, your experiences in working with other business models, how do you feel that those things have changed or how the, the model has changed as you scaled? And maybe some things to think about would be how you, if you're, if you're an individual owner, how you give up control, how you trust your team to make those sorts of decisions. Um, how your product portfolio may have changed or uh, improved or decreased, um, how you manage your customers, so forth and so on. So, you know, as your business grows, how does your model change and adapt to a growing market or a bigger business? Yeah, I, I can share a few things. I mean, the, we've talked a little bit about in terms of our background. So we started out growing in 2004 um, up in the, the Ithaca area, selling into local retailers and, and, and restaurants. And the whole plan at that time was small distributed farming, and the whole goal at that point was we're going to have 20 of these all around the state of New York, driving up and down. Our technology founder, whose job was with the Cornell Ag Program, helping deploy technology to help farmers, could see all these dilapidated warehouses, and he thought, you know, how can we repurpose that? Uh, so he started on the journey of being the small farmer, which well, we've heard a lot about, you know, how do you start that? And it's tough business because you have to wear so many different hats. And again, how do you generate enough revenue then to support the sg &A in terms of how do you build out? Uh, what was interesting is that he landed on a unique technology and way of growing so that in 2009, the business received significant investment from the clean tech community. And it was really then the business shifted and became an OEM, selling the technology and developing different project farms from that standpoint. So you definitely have to be responsive. But again, if you find something that's unique and differentiable and ownable, uh, that can help you know, bring in additional uh, opportunities. So I think our... Uh business model is and business plan has stayed pretty consistent since we started in 2007. Um, I think that there's certain things that change such as uh, diversification among our customers. So before I started there back in 2009, um, one of our biggest customers went under and that was 30 percent of our business. So it left us scrambling. We had to run down to the LA market and, and you're dumping product, I mean basically at cost. So we've, we've brought on more customers, and our, our sales team has really worked to get a broad customer base and diversify our, our product across that to protect us um, just in case anything should happen. Um, the only other thing that would really change, I mean, we want to keep growing, and we want to keep growing on site right now. So our plan is to hit 96 growing rooms with our Phase 3 expansion. And... The only thing that would change possibly moving forward is that we would maybe like to do more retail and less food service, and that's something that we'll, we'll probably work towards, but our, our core competency, competent, <laughs> excuse me, our core competencies, can't say that today, um, haven't changed. Our business plan is the same. Um, there's just certain things that we learn to do better within our operation and our process and, and uh, the most important thing, as, as Pierre and Mark both said, is just having the right team in place. And when something's not working or somebody isn't working, I mean, not being afraid to make the change and, and know that you'll get through it. But, I mean, if it's personnel is, is 100% um, the biggest factor for us, and we've had a lot of actually turnover in the last year in some pretty key roles, and I think the changes are all for the better. But it's uh, something that we've been uh, dealing with a lot as of late. And, um, again, business plan hasn't changed, but more some of the, the core practices and how we go about following through on that business plan are changing all the time. Oh, I just want to comment because, again, I think just having talked with Kevin earlier and thinking about his role, uh, he mentioned the company was started in 2007, but he's been there three years. How many companies have a role focused just on sustainability? I mean, I think that's a big commentary in terms of how they've thought. So when you think about how do you bring that business plan to life, that's a commitment from a resource standpoint that I think is pretty differentiated. So that's really neat. And before we move to Pierre, Kevin, I want to ask you a question. You mentioned a customer getting to be fairly large and then going under. Um, I think I've experienced that in the past. I'm sure others have experienced that as well. Do you guys now put, like, uh, do you try and balance that customer, maybe a percentage of business that one customer gets to before you start looking to diversify a little bit with your customer base? Uh, short answer, yes. 
Um, we've our biggest customer right now is uh, Rayleigh's, and um, we're never say never, but we're we're pretty confident that they're they're going to be around for the long haul. Um, and we actually partnered with them on a uh, sustainable recycled uh, till mushroom till um, to develop. So they're our biggest, and they're not nearly as big as the one that I referenced before. Um, so. Right now, we've got you know thirty some odd customers, and um, yeah, if anyone gets too big and and we're we have any doubt about the stability of that business, you can be sure that we're going to diversify and you know lessen our risk. And Pierre, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. You know, being a, the founder of the company, and and as you grow, how you give up, how you trust people within your organization to take control of certain uh, processes. Great question. I'm a huge believer in letting, you, trusting your team and letting them make mistakes. Um, it, you know, actually, this is a, a whole class that's that in my MBA school program. We had a, an entire class devoted because they believe that's how important it is, and I truly believe that is too. In, in how you um, can allow is create the right team and allow them to make the mistakes in a controlled way. Um, you know, that that's that's hugely important. It's it's you're we're talking about scaling a, an existing operation. You cannot scale something if you micromanage. Micromanagement is not is not a scalable thing to do. You have to allow your people to to build their own skills up, um, and the only way to do that is to allow them to to make their own mistakes. Um, you know we've implemented a, a policy that if anybody ever comes to us with a challenge, an issue, a production problem at our office. They cannot approach us unless they have a solution to go with it. Whether it's good or bad, as long as they come to us with the best solution that they've came up with, and then we coach them through how to either do that, or if we don't agree with that solution, how to, how to arrive to the one that we would have arrived to. Um, and that's huge. I think that that's something that it's an investment that needs to be made. Many times you think that somebody comes to you and you see you could probably solve the, the challenge twice as fast as they could. And so your, ten, your natural tendency is to say, step aside, let me fix it really quick. Um, and, and that's, you're making a mistake. Uh, you're, you're not investing in your people and you're not, that's something that when you want to take a vacation, that same problem is not going to be handled the way that you would have wanted it to. So uh, huge, huge, huge. I, I truly believe that uh, allowing your team, building it up in such a way and coaching your people um, to be able to, to make decisions and understand your thought process so that they can follow it the same way that you would have um, is, is a critical part of being successful and scaling your operation. I'm still in shock that you get to take vacations. <laughs> so anybody want to add anything to how, you, how the models changed, whether additional comments on uh, uh, regulatory issues, HR management, anything you guys want to add as the business is growing, maybe employees are growing, additional regula regula uh, regulatory issues you may have to, have to deal with? Uh, just on the HR side, I mean, again, we've talked a little bit about the challenge of human capital, and that's absolutely critical in terms of putting together that world-class team and having subject matter expertise. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk a little bit about my background. My background has been in retail and brand management. I had headed the marketing for a supermarket chain uh, and a line of specialty gourmet markets. So again, we've talked a lot about how to market the product, how to, you know, how to find the right channels. And so we've got great technology, we've got great product, but again, how do you make sure you get the right distribution? So bringing those perspectives to the table. Uh, operation side, you know, again, people will run world-class facilities. Uh, so it's a matter of bringing together the right uh, set of skills, I think, from that standpoint. And uh, at the end of the day, there's so much to do, you have to let people run. You can't micromanage either. I want to move to the biggest challenges that you guys, and, this, and let's try and maybe share some personal experiences here, but the biggest challenges you feel you faced as you've gone through these uh, different experiences in your careers. Um, as you scale up, you think, if you have experience with multiple locations, maybe touch on that. Um, Relationships with your vendors or your suppliers, whether that's from packing material or fertilizers, how, however that works for you. Um, and then maybe even touching a little bit more on uh, additional comments on your relationship with your bank or who's ever financing you. So, Pierre, why don't you start? Uh, that's like the mother load of all questions. Right? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to say what the one you know, def defining challenge is really, there's so many challenges that you face on, on, on many fronts, whether it be regulatory, um, human, human resources, uh, production, 
um, the actual aspect of farming and, and that part, uh, raising capital, dealing with your banks, and et cetera. Each one of these presents its own different type of challenge. Um, it's, you know, from my perspective, uh, you, you don't want to try to be the smartest person on your team um, because that means that you, there's no way that you are the best in each one of those fields. You want to bring people onto your team who are better than you are in the areas that you're not necessarily good at. So, you, you know, from a person who, who runs my own uh, business and I'm looking to, to scale this on, on a national level, I'm looking at first, what are my deficiencies as far as where do I need help? Is it in marketing, the growing aspect, the, the actual operational standpoint, these types of things. So in my business plan, um, part of that is actually identifying what are the areas that we need to build to have a robust kind of a, a strong area in each one of these places because challenges will present themselves from all aspects. The growing side, financial side, customer side, sales side, human resources. You need to be able to have a way to, to deal with that. Um, obviously, when you're small, you don't have the luxury of having uh, the ability to bring somebody on board and afford to have someone in each one of those places. So you do have to wear all those hats. But as you grow, um, you know, you really kind of have to have your, your, your list in mind of what are the most important things kind of in order. What do I want to add on first? Is it going to be a grower because um, you know growing is actually not my expertise? I'm better at the business side, or vice versa. So you know those. That's part of, of my business plan. Actually, it's it's having that, and also you know sometimes you have your own mission, and things aren't really changing as far as as you. you things are going according to plan, but outside forces change. New com new competitors come in. Great new, you know, uh, disruptive technologies can, can come in and and really kind of start to redefine the, the space that you're in. So you have to be adaptive and you have to be able to to get in and rewrite, retweak your business plan. And I think it's really important, even though you might end up doing it every month. It, it, you know, your business plan changes a little. It's important to sit down, take a minute, and just rethink your strategy. Um, you don't want to be working in your business. You want to work on your business. And in order to do that, you really have to have kind of a thirty thousand foot view of what's going on, anticipate regulatory changes, and, and just anything in, in general, and, and be able to see around the corner. Um, you know, one of my mentors, and I, I agree with the way that they kind of have helped structure the way that I look at spending my time, is 50% of my time spent with customers, building customers, looking at the future and building that. 25% spent on R&D, being what are the, the new products, new technologies, new ways that we can improve those types of things, and the last 25% on putting out fires, just the things that inevitably come up and that you, 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 know, you don't actually contribute to building your business. Um, and on that last one, it's really hard to let that last 25%, the, the putting out fires, engulf you, and that's where having the right team in place will allow you to actually work on your customers and R&D and, and build your business. So I think that We've had uh, many challenges as we've scaled up. Um, you've got your the growing side, obviously. You know, you have your harvesting team, you have your growing team, you have your composting team, your packaging team. You tie food safety into all aspects of that. We we brought on a full time uh, food safety manager uh, when we first started, and couldn't have done it without him. Um, obviously, the regulatory climate in California is. Um, on the front end all the time, I mean, regardless of what you're dealing with. Um, we're, right now we're in the process of um, strengthening some of the more backup ancillary processes of our operation and realizing that at, with such a mechanized uh, operation, we have a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of equipment. We need a lot of repairing done. If something breaks down and doesn't get fixed in a timely manner, you start losing product. So. We've actually uh, developed and um, really worked on structuring our maintenance department in the last six months, brought on a full-time maintenance manager. We have a 12-person team, and they're running, I mean, around the clock to keep, keep our operation running smoothly. It's things like that that when you're first starting, you're probably not thinking about, oh, I'm going to need a 12-person maintenance team when I get up to uh, 200 people. Um, and then just really working to define our best practices for harvesting. How do they pick the mushrooms? What are the documented growing procedures, composting? There's a lot of things that um, were inside the growers' heads when they, when they first started. And if one of them leaves or you know, has a bad day, doesn't show up, no one else has that, that knowledge. So the 
biggest challenge and kind of where we're at now is really documenting practices and procedures for every aspect of the operation so that it's a sustainable model. It's everything is on site that's needed so personnel can change, but the business stays the same. Um, it's, it's just uh, something that we've really realized and started to focus on with some uh, key changes is, is having those practices documented, knowing how to enforce them, but also um, keeping them flexible and, and adapting as, you know, as the industry changes and as the regulatory climate changes. Mark? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're fortunate in, in, in many regards. Um, we're actually well-resourced, well-financed. We have a seasoned, experienced team. Um, our biggest challenge right now, though, is about how do we keep up with demand? And so how do we manage multiple projects uh, and run execution? And so we're up in scale-up mode as a business as well, and turn not only our operations and our different projects, uh, but we're looking to hire people. We've talked about the human capital. So, again, people are looking for opportunities. Please feel free to come talk to us. We're happy to talk to you as well. Uh, lots of opportunities overall in this industry, and, you know, we're, we're happy to be one of the paths here. And one more question, and then we're going to open uh, one more question to the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions to the audience. Um, kind of in closing, when do you know you've made the right decisions? Kevin, why don't you start with that? Do you want to put that in context or just in general, <laughs> when, you, when you've made the right? Yeah, I mean, how do, you, how do you decide? You know, you've got a plan. You start to make decisions. You start to see reactions either from the market or from your own team or from... Uh, your, your your sales reports. Yeah. You know, when do you decide that, man, I, I made the right decision, whether it was making an investment, hiring a person, um, yeah, any of those above? Yeah. So I think that, you know, obviously the financials, if, if those are right, you're, you're on the right track. But I think more importantly, that comes as a result of your relationships with your customers and then your relationship with your team and your company culture. So company culture is something that I think is really important and we're really uh, starting to take a, a hard look at, I know Pierre has mentioned with his team, how if you have a problem, that's great, but come to me with a solution too. Um, it's easy in an, in an operation like this to, hey, this isn't working, I need this fixed right now, or this, is this, this. It's like, okay, like take a step back and think about how you can help us solve this problem. So really just focusing on <laughs> that culture. And when you have a guy like so, you know, for the energy side, people will come to me and say, hey, can we recycle this? Or, you know, I've got an idea for like an energy project over here. You know, I love that. That's that's what I want. And that just shows that, you know, what you're doing is, is starting to get through and, and the team's starting to uh, rally around behind what you're doing. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about, you know, why are people here today and what, what brings us here, and it's around a passion, it's around trying to make a difference. And I think food is so democratic and having an opportunity to be able to change, you know, how food is grown and having access to it is really important. And I think for us, when we see the excitement and the magic is when we do tastings and we see the excitement from not only the top chefs but to the inner city kids and thinking about how we can change behaviors and thinking about, again, how we can do it on a consistent basis all year round and do it in a way that we're creating jobs and giving back. So those are the things that get us really excited and it's about that shared vision. And Pierre? I think that question is actually deeper than, than uh, it sounds. You know, I think it's really important to set milestones or objectives that are really quantifiable and measurable to know, hey, I, I actually I'd made the right decision or the, the right thing happened or I, I reached the, the goal that I wanted to reach. The danger with saying I reached the goal that I want to reach is that you should right away set another goal because you can't get complacent. Um, you, you have to be continuously adapting, moving forward, thinking of what's to come because uh, if you're not, your competitor is um, or the, the market's changing, regula regulations are changing. Um, so good question. <laughs> In the audience, do you guys have any additional questions for the panel? Either we were really good or you guys are really tired. <laughs>
Yeah, I'll start with that one. So as part, as a, part of our uh, safety program, our safety manager has also uh, worked with some of the frontline supervisors to develop uh, a program that we call Safety Bingo. So basically every department has a team and every day that they go injury free, there's basically a bingo and a number. And if they hit bingo, uh, say that there's been, you know, 180 days without an injury, and every department gets to participate. Say three people win bingo on that day. It usually, or it's usually, you know, it takes three to four weeks to to hit a bingo. But everyone on that team walks home with a $200 check or whoever won bingo just for being safe. I mean, there's no requirement there. We don't have to do that. We want to do that. And it's something that I think that shows that, you know, we, we care about you. You know, we, we're acknowledging that, you know, we, we want you to be part of this team and we value you. And, you know, it's, it's just the little things like that that actually make a big difference when you, when you really look at it. And had, have been getting great feedback from the supervisors, you know, talking to their employees about it. And our, our safety manager has really done a great job of, of working with our team to, to implement that on the ground floor. I want to add something to that. Uh, the, the management's team, or the, your, the management, your job, part of your job is to keep the morale high and keep the spirit going, as, as you're kind of mentioning there. For us, one of the interesting things that we do is if you come into our greenhouse, uh, one of the first things you notice is that it's, it's like a nightclub. We have huge speakers along, strung along the entire greenhouse, not, not just like, oh, we play music. I mean, we play serious music, loud, high tempo. Um, the employees get to choose their songs. We, we pay for the ad-free Pandora thing so they could put that on. And you'd be incredibly surprised at how that improves productivity, reduces chatter amongst employees because you're enjoying it. You get into the rhythm of things. Um, and it, it really makes a huge difference. And you know, when vendors show up, when people come take a tour, it's, it's, there's an ambience in there. I mean, you come in and the music's pumping and you're like, what? Um, and you know, that really sets a vibe and it sets a tone of, one, we care. Everyone kind of, you, you get into the spirit of, it, it lifts your, your spirits. Um, and there's a psychological component as, as to doing that. Um, also, we post um, everywhere that we can in, in doorways and things like that. I'm here because I'm excellent. And it just kind of reminds you that you're, you're working here because we chose you, because you deserve to be here, because you do an excellent job. And again, part of psychology and just keeping everyone feeling like, you know, the, if I do an excellent job, the product comes out, excellent quality, and it all, it's one big circle, everyone wins. Um, and, and these are things that we try to do to kind of uh, infuse the psychology into our employees of, of excellence all the way around, um, from top to bottom, and having fun at work. Mark, did you want to touch on it as well? Or? Um, we, we, too, have similar programs where, again, it starts with a shared vision, making sure there's good communication. Um, good accountability so that they again clear expectations uh, but it's really about sharing in this process and I think that's what's exciting because it feels like it's a movement as opposed to a job and so I think that's an important part of you know how we try to communicate and how we try to recruit and that's really all starts with that recruiting process as well we do a lot of vetting we do a lot of things around making sure from a value system that there's good alignment there yeah, question in the center or we'll come here and then go there Uh, good question. Thanks. For, um, you know, actually, I think fortunate was a, a poor choice of words on my behalf because I don't really believe in, in luck, per se. Um, uh, the, uh, what we did was basically I, I kind of saw that, that in order to sell, it's not about selling the product or the business itself. It's more about selling the individual and, and why they're going to believe that anybody who they invest in is going to face challenges. And if you can sell the fact that no matter what challenge you get, you're going you're gonna to keep going or you're going to die trying. You're not a quitter. You're not somebody who's going to be, 
you know, disarrayed or you just you can't take the pressure anymore. Um, that, that was one of the, the first things that I found that really attracted people to come to, to hear us out. Because I, I don't think there is a scarcity of good ideas and good projects out there for people to invest in. I think, if anything, there, there's a lot. So really, one of the big differentiating factors is, is the human, the, 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 the management team that they're going to be investing in. So one of the things that I really tried to, to put out there was why we're not going to fail for, for lack of energy, research, due diligence, any of the things that could be a, a, a shortfall on, on my behalf or my team's behalf. Then beyond that, you know, you have a good project that you've put together as everybody here, you know, you could think of a, a good business plan, um, but really it comes down to connecting with, with, your, with those people. And, and then word travels. Um, you know, people start wanting to see and, and, and hear about it. And uh, another thing is, is not to just go with the first offer that sounds really good. Um, you know, I, I was incredibly surprised when I chose the person who I was going to go with um, to come back and say no to the other folks who were offering us, that they came back with way beyond what I would have ever had the courage to ask them for. Um, and, and really, I mean, that's a testament to, to just uh, what, what, you know, how far you can go with, with, with that. So does that kind of answer your question? I met with just about every one of those categories from, from uh, traditional VC firms who look at very structured um, term sheets and you know all the mechanisms that come with a typical VC type deal. Um, also high net worth individuals who typically, if they're sophisticated, have a somewhat of a VC style. Um, and then also industry partners, um, people who are uh, existing operators in the industry who want to have an arm in organic produce or, or something like that. Um, it definitely takes energy to put yourself out there and make yourself available for people to, to know about you and, and, and to come and see you. When you're tapping into the VC world, um, they tend to also want to make themselves known. So, you, you know, it's not too hard to, to find VCs and, and kind of go get their, try to get their attention. Um, now, you have to imagine there's a thousand other people trying to get their attention, so you have to kind of get through that noise. Um, but once you start to get one or two who actually give you offers or term sheets, that's where you say thank you, and now everyone else starts to take you more seriously when you say, I have, I have an offer from so-and-so. Now they really want to look more deeply into you. And it kind of snowballs, but it really is hard to get that first breakthrough, or at least it was for me, because I don't come from the background of knowing tons of finance people and that type of thing. I had to really get out there and seek it. Um, and, you know, it's just networking, you know, making yourself available, going out to events where there may or may not be somebody who would be of value of meeting, but you just go and, and being out there. Uh, I've heard 80% of being successful is showing up, and that's true. You just make yourself available, you keep getting out there, and it, it's, it's a numbers game. It's really just about uh, probability. You're out there enough, you'll meet people, and you'll network. This gentleman over here. <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 <clears throat> there are a couple things to that. One is uh, we pay fair market wages, and that's going to be market specific depending on the different uh, locations. Uh, we pay benefits. So, again, we think about traditional farming work, it's typically seasonal, itinerant, without benefits. And so, right now, in and of itself, we're affording something that's going to be year round, consistent, and with benefits. And so, that's a tremendous uh, opportunity you know, for, for the community from that standpoint. Kevin, can you touch on that at all? With, I mean, you come from a little bit larger business and uh, maybe touch more of the general ag industry than what Mark yeah, or I mean, BMA. I can speak to, to our business a little bit. So um, it is year-round employment. Uh, mushroom farming is 24-7, 365. 
So you know that your job's going to be there as long as you're doing it right. Um, we actually are on a piece rate. So if you're working hard, you can make 3 $4 an hour more than the minimum wage. So, I mean, there, there's good compensation there. And I think uh, added bonus points is in the summer, it's 105 degrees in Calusa. The growing rooms are a nice uh, 68 degrees year-round. So, <laughs> Yeah, just to build on that in terms of the working environment conditions, obviously uh, we're growing indoors, no pesticides. Uh, it's a much safer, much more uh, amenable working environment. And I would just add that some of what I think we look at the different levels of jobs in agriculture as well. Um, if you look at opportunities to be a head grower at a, at, at a large commercial greenhouse, for example, there's definitely good financial opportunity for young people looking to get into that, into that industry um, versus comparing it to maybe seasonal labor, as these guys have mentioned a couple of times. Yeah, I think we do offer a lot better opportunity. Time for one more question. Pierre, why don't you take this one? I'll definitely be happy to take this one. You know, when we started off, uh, zero customers, um, we had no idea who, who do you go and who do you contact first. Um, really, it's it's just knocking on their door. So um, I want to talk to, you know, name, name a store, whether it be Rayleigh's or whoever. It's literally you call the, the corporate headquarters and who's the buyer. And, you, you know, for step number one is getting in the door, you know, just – uh, it, which is challenging. There's no secret sauce to how you just get in there. Being if you're starting from ground zero, let's say, you know, you don't really have that track record. Now, once you get in, things that I have found to be very important to to them is consistent is consistency. Absolutely, um, they want to know that if I'm going to take your product, one is the consistency as far as the quality of the product going to be there, and also is the availability is your consistency as far as whenever I order it, you're going to have it. Um, those are two incredibly important points. Um, <clears throat> Of course, uh, above that comes food safety standards and all the things that, you know, are kind of either you go above and beyond or you, you check all those boxes right away. Um, I would uh, recommend that you try to study a little bit what each, each buyer and customer has different things that they focus on. Um, Whole Foods really focuses on their growers, for example. They, they like to showcase um, these are our growers. They're, they're very local and those types of things. Um, other stores, they, they like to focus on their consistency or that their prices are low or, or things like that. So you will kind of tailor your discussion, your pitch, to um, kind of understanding what their value proposition is for their customer. You try to kind of relate to that and give them the same value proposition so they could pass it on to their ultimate customer. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, this is my background coming from the supermarket business, and the buyer is a key key gatekeeper here. But you have to be talking their language, right? You have to understand not only is it the consistency and the quality, you have to talk about the right pricing, margin. You need to know what they need to do, to uh, earn on that. If, you, if it's too far apart, obviously, you're not going to be uh, aligned and have that same starting point. You need to understand their pain points, whether it is delivery, whether it's consistency, uh, volatility in the marketplace, shrink issues all around and that can be related to this. So once you have that basis, then you can be able to have a, a really meaningful di discussion. I would say not necessarily. You have to go to them first. There's the Apple concept, which is um, the, my customer doesn't know yet what I can grow, things that I can do that are unique that they don't even know exist. Um, so, you know, we have found that for certain products coming to them and, oh, my goodness, this is incredible. I've never seen anything like it. That's one way. If you go to them and ask them what, what do they want, you, you should also realize other growers are probably aware of, you know, they have a pain point. I don't have enough lettuce. And at some point, that, that void will be filled. And, you know, you're going against that current. Um, so these are just kind of ways of doing things. But, I mean, th there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, it depends just how you think you could 
give them value. And we're at our time right now. So would everybody please thank the panelists? And here's Nicola. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so we have our last networking break of the day. Um, there's coffee.